So you should always hire in multiple sets of sellers, not for competition, but because it's actually not, not that much more work to teach people, you know, teach a group of people than to teach one person. So if you bring in one seller, you're still going to have to spend, I don't know, whatever it is, a hundred hours, getting them up to speed, enabling them, coaching them. If you bring in four sellers, you're probably going to have to spend 120 hours because all of those same sessions are going to be the exact same for those four people. The other reason you should hire, you know, clusters of people is because they're going to be there to support and build with each other. It's always more fun when you're working together in a group, you're shooting off ideas, ideas. You're staying up late. You're hacking through things, you know, like early days at Slack. I mean, it was nights and weekends. We couldn't even handle the load of inquiries that were coming in. And it was always best to be able to do it in groups versus to be kind of solo and alone. So if you can quite literally afford to hire multiple people, you should always do that. I mean, the amount of companies, you know, with 50 million in the bank and no product market fit, I'm sure they'll be able to afford it. That's the least of the problem. Um, <laughs> but now we know the profile uh, and we know that we need to hire two. I want to actually just dig in on the hiring process. So yeah. with two co-founders, you know, you have your wonderful, amazing experience and you're going to help me. What non-obvious characteristics or traits would these reps have that we want to see in the interview process first? Obviously, besides ambition, hard work and all the other normals. Yep. So there's two that are single most important that I look for in early stage hires. First one is ambiguity. They're the, the ability to deal with ambiguity. And this is actually something I tell every single person that I interview for Webflow is if you are not okay with ambiguity, meaning things are going to change every day, every week, every quarter, if you need stability, this is not the place for you. And so often you'll see people are like, yeah, yeah, I'm, you know, I want to build, I want hyper growth. And then they get there and they just can't handle the thrash of the constant change. This is, this is what I tell all girlfriends. If you want stability, this is not the place for you. And sometimes I wonder why I'm single, Maggie. Brutal life. <laughs> <laughs> well, there, there you go. That might be your answer. But in, in building a company, it's really important that people can handle ambiguity, right? Like if you want something that is steady, that is playbooks, that is well baked out, go somewhere that is already 10,000. Joe, Joe, jokes aside, everyone says, oh yeah, yeah, that's me. Love a yeah. bit of ambiguity. How do you test if they actually are happy with changing tides and ambiguity in the workplace? Yeah. You actually asked for examples. Tell me about a time that a process changed right away. How did you handle it? How did you learn about it? What did you do? How did you react? How did you help implement this process that you needed, that you identified needed to be changed? What did you do? How did you spot it? You know, what was the impact that you knew making this process change would be? And that also is helping me really look and understand, is this someone that's a bit of a go-getter and a, you know, going to take the bull by its horns, or are they going to wait for all of the process to change on their own and just kind of go with the flow. I sat in the corner and cried. <laughs> exactly. And then the other thing, Harry, that I think is really important for these first hires is people who can embrace the chaos. I absolutely love that term of just embracing the chaos. There are very few things in a startup or a hyper growth company that are ever going to be stable. So it's very similarly tied to notion of ambiguity, but like, it's going to be crazy. It's going to be hectic. Are you okay with that? And do you thrive on that? Or is that just again, too much? And do you just need something a little bit more stable? Or are you okay with having, you know, in my case in Slack, I think I probably had seven different jobs within my six years there. It's been very similar at Webflow. One day it's like, hey, can you take on your SE org? Can you go build out sales dev? Go build out partner dev. Cool. We're going to build out enterprise and majors. Start thinking about that. Cool. Let's build out our growth team. Start thinking about how you're going to do that. And you have to find someone who can work on different levels of multi-altitude and be able to be very high up top here, thinking through strategy, but also really roll up their sleeves and be in the weeds so we know now that we need embracing chaos and ambiguity yes now we need to actually engage in the hiring process yes. how do we structure the process just walk me through it like is it one meeting and then job offer is it one meeting qualification how do we actually structure the process yep absolutely so let's talk about structuring the process and if it's okay i can actually talk to you too about what are some of my favorite interview questions, if that's mm -hmm. of interest? First, let's start about talking about the process, maybe some do's and don'ts there. I am a big believer in hire thoughtfully, 
but fire fast. And I'm sure we'll talk about the fire fast later on, but it's really important to call out here that a hiring mistake can cost a company to the tune of $1 million. And that's because of all of the time it takes to interview candidates, to write the job offer or write the job rec, to get the recruiters prepped, to get this person their offer letter, to get them started, to all the time it takes to train and enable them. I mean, enterprise sellers can be upwards of six months to then only have them be crap and not bring in any revenue. And then all of a sudden now you're nine months down the road and they've brought in nothing and now you're firing them and you have to start that whole cycle all over again. That all that time lost, time savings, you know, also just bad morale when people are getting fired and, you know, or laid off, it's, it's always bad morale. So really important to be extremely thoughtful about your hiring process. There is nothing that you can do that is more important than hire the right people to help you build your ship. So let's talk about what that hiring process should look like. Uh, for us, it's pretty lengthy. It's a recruiter phone screen, hiring manager phone screen, whole panel of what we call a chronological interview, which is essentially a very deep dive into your resume. It's then a bit of kind of a, a cultural-ish assessment where you're just meeting different members of the team. Then you have a final round. And one of the most common things that I think people do quite wrong in their final round is they ask people to demo their product. I think this is one of the absolute worst things that you can do. I'll tell you why. One, no one is going to know your product as well as you're going to know your product. So Harry, you're an AE, you're coming and you're pitching to me and you're pitching, you know, Webflow. In the back of my mind, I'm going to be like, I would have said this differently there. Oh, you missed this thing. You missed this key spot. I will, I will almost never be able to fully remove out any previous bias and what I know from my own product. The other thing too is candidly, quite frankly, I just think it's a bit disrespectful to ask someone to really learn and lean in and know every single nuance of your own product. This person, if they are a top performer, they are probably working at another company, another job. Maybe they have families, maybe they have girlfriends, boyfriends, they have another life and the ROI is just not going to be there for asking them to demo your product for the amount of time it's going to take for them to actually learn how to do it. So I'll tell you what I like to do instead. It sounds pretty funny, but I love to start off all of our final round interviews with a pitch something you love. One, it's a warm up exercise, but two, I want to see how do you pitch when you are so excited and passionate about something? You know, maybe you love baking so much and you just want to talk about baking. I want to see Harry, how are you lighting up when you are pitching something that you're passionate about? Because the assumption is you're probably not passionate about, you know, web flow just yet. Hopefully you'll yeah. be there someday, but you are darn passionate about baking. How do you light up? Because that's going to show me how you light up when you're presenting to customers. The second thing that I am looking for here is how do you explain concepts, right? So if you're coming in and you're pitching to me about baking, I'm going to ask you, you know, all different types of questions about heat, about temperature, about how long it needs to be in the oven, but all these different areas. And I want to see how you are teaching me as your perspective buyer all these different things that I might not know about because in selling a technical software product, there's very often going to be a lot of teaching and I want to see how you can teach your prospective buyer. I love that in terms of pitch something you love. So say I pitch something that I love, um, mm -hmm. uh, Peloton, uh, good example, uh, pitch something I love and you love it and you think that's great and you want to move forward. Comp is, is always a big part of any discussion with any sales team or anyone really joining any company, um, yes. unless, you know, that non-profit, which was a word you said at the beginning, which I didn't really fully understand being a venture capitalist, but I hear it's something. Um, so tell me, uh, in terms of lessons around comp, mm -hmm. how do you advise founders on structuring a package that's enticing for sales reps and really doing comp well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And actually, I, to wrap up kind of the hiring thought, we also, after pitch something you love, we actually do a mock discovery call. And that is equally as important, if not actually more important than pitch something you What's love. What's a mock discovery call? You held that back. Yeah. Okay. So I'm actually going to tell you what our prompt is. Uh, so for anyone listening that someday is going to interview at Webflow, here you go. You have some insight into our prompt. Um, okay. So here's our prompt for the mock discovery call. Essentially, you know, myself or our panelist of internal, usually it's always hiring managers. We are going to pretend to be 
a company. And in our case right now, we actually pick Miro. So every single person that ever interviews with us, they are doing a mock discovery call against the company Miro. And the AE, so the person that's interviewing to actually be one of our AEs, they are pretending to be a Webflow AE. And we make it very clear to them that you don't need to know, you know, the nuts and bolts of the product, kind of going back to my standpoint on demos. But what you need to be able to do is you need to run a very thorough discovery. You need to be able to understand pain. You need to be able to articulately pitch what Webflow is and the problem that we solve. We're also looking for things like, are you wrapping in relevant, you know, customer case studies? Are you finding that Mural, who is one of Miro's competitors, is actually one of our customers and has a whole case study on our site? So we're looking for curiosity. We're looking for research. We're also looking for coachability at the end of the mock discovery we actually give them live coaching on the spot on what we would have liked to see differently. And we look for how they react to that coaching. Are they making excuses? Are they blaming? Or are they kind of, you know, taking this and owning it and being like, oh my gosh, you're so right. Can we actually just redo it and redo that role play? And that's what I love to see. It's, it's okay if someone doesn't do an excellent job. These are high stakes, high pressure. But what I want to see is how are you taking that coaching and are you applying a growth mindset or are you getting defensive and blaming? And you would you know, be so surprised at the amount of people that we see that either write off the feedback or they get super defensive about it. And we will point blank, never hire them. Wow. No, I mean, I, I totally agree. How do you think about just insecurity there? Like I could just be a really insecure person and I'm getting the feedback and I'm like, oh, I put so much time and effort into it and actually... You know, I'm unloved and alone in my personal life. And now I'm unloved and alone in this Webflow interview. And I could actually be really talented, but I could just be quite insecure. I mean, should you be in sales? Aren't most people in sales insecure? <laughs> yeah, but, but I mean, it's all about how you handle that feedback, right? Again, it's, it's, are you someone that's gotten feedback before? Because like, I can tell you, there's a lot of times that I've been given really tough feedback and it's all about how you handle and how you implement that feedback and how you use it moving forward for your next steps. Miss, what's the hardest bit of feedback you've ever been given? Oh boy. So I'm going to take you back on a little bit of a journey to two weeks in to my management career where I had um, probably the biggest learning lesson that I will ever have that just to this day just makes me squeamish. But let me tell you what it was because here we are now many years removed and I can talk about it pretty, yeah, quite a bit easier. So I was early on management career and I thought, you know, Coming in, Maggie, I'm a new manager. I have all the authority in the world to approve big old pricing discounts. You know, I can do whatever I want. So I gave the authority to approve a $200,000 credit to a customer at Slack that my team was selling into. Oh yeah, your face right now. Yikes, right? So went, got the deal done, got it closed. I'm celebrating, you know, we're about to close this massive deal. And I get a call from my VP of customer success, Christina Kosmowski. I will never forget this call. I wanted to pass out and vomit. And she was basically like, Maggie, what the bleep? did you just do? And what did you offer to this customer? Tell me this did not happen. And really the lesson that I learned here is it is so important to go slow, to go fast. And what I mean by this is even in a hyper growth, hyper scaling company, it's so important to take that step back, to look at the problem, the objective from all different angles and really try to understand like, what is it that I need to do? What are all the steps I need to follow? Where are my blind spots? Because what I'm going to, whether it be offer to a customer or change within an entire org or whatever structure I'm going to implement is going to have huge long stream impacts and effects down the road. So again, just because you're hyperscale does not mean that you should be reckless. And I'm actually so thankful this happened to me early days in my career, because since then, every single single project or problem or, you know, big process that I'm thinking of these things, if I make a big comp change or a big team structure change, that can actually have huge impacts on my org's careers and the money that they make. And that's why it's so important to always slow down, cross your T's, dot your I's. Oh, my word. I'm feeling your pain on that one. Oh, it was horrible, um, but so glad it happened then. 
that is really tough. Um, my word, I'm sorry. Oh, um, all good. All good. <laughs> glad um, I asked that one. Um, <laughs> listen, you learn you learn from these times as well. You learn from um, these. Times. So, okay, question: What are your favorite questions to ask? What are most revealing of great quality candidates? Yep. So I'll walk you through some of my more tactical ones. And and really the thing I'm looking for here is a lot about accountability. So first question that I'm going to ask you, you know, as a, as a hiring leader, as you let's pretend you're an AE coming the, in the door. The first thing I want to know from you is what, tell me about a deal that you've lost within your career. And I'm looking here within asking these questions on the deal lost is I'm looking for, are you blaming people? Are you taking responsibility for this deal that we, that lot was lost? It's totally okay to lose a deal. We all lose deals. But what I want to know is, are you saying, you know, I lost the deal because of the product. I lost the deal because of the competitor. I lost the deal because my SE screwed up. Or are you taking ownership for why you lost this deal? So are you actually saying, you know, I was not multi-threaded enough. I made a big mistake where I didn't get in front of the buyer as fast as I should have. Or I just, you know, assumed that the person I was talking to was the buyer and I didn't realize there was a whole separate buying committee. So am I looking, what I'm looking for again here is like, are you taking ownership and responsibility or are you blaming someone else? The next thing that I love to dive into is stack ranking. So Harry, you know, you're coming to me from the sales team at Asana. How many people are on your team? Oh, there was eight people. Cool. Out of those eight, where did you come up on the leaderboard? You know, Maggie, I, I was at four. And what I'm looking for here, it's, it's actually okay if you were at four. But what I want to know is what is it that those top three people that beat you did differently than you? Again, what I'm looking for here is self-awareness, but I'm also looking for blame. So are you saying I actually had someone pretty recently be like, oh, they had a better territory than me. And it's like, control what you can control. That's not a good excuse. Like territories are always going to be all over the place. Or is it, you know what, Lauren, she was our number one rep. She was so diligent at managing her time. She would wake up and first thing she would do is spend her first hour prospecting, next hour customer calls, and that's why she was the top rep. So again, are you looking, are you blaming or are you taking ownership and sharing what other people could have done better? Well, and it's all kinds, I mean, you, you get all excuses all over the world that people get. I had a bad manager, I had a bad SE, I had a bad SDR, whatever. Like, Take ownership of your destiny. That's the only way you're ever going to be successful. So what's the, what's the other one? Yep. So the next question that I like to ask is I, this is a bit of a long one, but if you could go back in time 10 years and coach yourself on something that you wish you knew now, what would it be? Again, same themes here of what I'm looking for. Are you, you know, first off, is this person, are they thoughtful? Are they very introspective? Are they saying, you know, I made this mistake or I made this poor company choice or, you know, I did, I did this thing wrong. I used to push through deals way too fast. I would tell myself to, you know, have a better attitude or to slow down the seal deal cycle and uncover all the different rocks. And then that actually allows me, Harry, to go in many different layers deeper and uncover, you know, why did they make these mistakes? How were they thinking about it at the time? How would they then implement that now? What are examples of what they've done now to implement whatever X mistake was? Such a good question. And then I finally like to, the other you know, kind of magical question that I really like to ask people is, what is something that I didn't ask you that you were hoping I would ask you? First off, that just gives you a chance to brag. You know, maybe you prepped some incredible story and you didn't get the chance to share it within your interview. It lets you open up and brag and share presumably a really big success and highlight that I probably want to hear about it. But secondly, it also lets me see how much did you prepare for this interview? Did you, you know, think through different stories and different patterns? Did you get ahead of what potential questions and objections might come at you? Because very often people who we will almost certainly never hire will say, nope, you asked everything, all good. And like, no, no, not all good. How many, okay, that, on that one, how many people actually say, no, I'm good. No, no, that was great. About 25%. Oh, wow. That's quite impressive. It's quite a bit. Yeah. But usually people are be like, I was hoping you would ask me about, you know, the craftiest I ever got in a deal and how I ended up earning the customer trust. And then, then I'm like, cool, tell me all about it. And then they go tell me all about it. And now everyone's really happy and laughing.